Welcome to the first, first and finest. I'm Russ Eisenstein, the voice of the Ohio Bobcats. What is first and finest, you ask? Well, it's a show about Ohio athletics, huh? Uh, but what it is, is fun and facts. The personification of infotainment that we talk about on our broadcast all the time. Information and entertainment about Ohio athletics during this crazy time. You're going to hear from administrators, from student athletes, from coaches, from special guests, from outstanding broadcasters as well in a monthly show that will come out at or around the first of the month. Get it? The first and finest. The name? Well, you know that Ohio was the first and the finest university in the Northwest Territory and the last charter member left standing in the Mid-American Conference. And of course, when it comes out, it all makes sense. You put the puzzle together and it's the first and finest. And bottom line here, we need all of the information and all of the fun that we can get during this time. Uh, if we started a job during this crazy year, it would be pretty interesting, I'm sure. Ohio Athletic Director Julie Cromer is coming down the home stretch of her first year on the job as Ohio's Athletic Director, and she is the first guest on First and Finest, and she joins us now. Julie, hello, welcome. How are you? Well, hello, thank you, and I'm doing well, and I'm excited to be the first guest on First and Finest. Um, this has been such a wild time, obviously, for so many reasons, but most importantly, uh, you and your family staying safe, staying healthy. We are. Thank you for asking, and I hope the same is uh, true for you and, and for those who are watching us. It has been an interesting first year. Um, but I think it's been an unprecedented year for all of us. So we've been very fortunate to stay healthy. We are enjoying a summer in Athens, even if it is a little bit different than summers to come. Uh, we're getting out, we're getting into the community, we're getting out on the trails and, and, and we are staying safe and healthy. Thank you. Yeah, full disclosure here, we are really social distancing with this interview. I'm back in Illinois, Julie's in her mansion in Athens. <laughs> um, and further full disclosure here too, we are taping this on the morning of August the 5th, Wednesday morning, August the 5th. So as we know, everything can change at a moment's notice. It's already been a very busy sports news day. So from that standpoint of where we are right now, Julie, where are we when it comes to college athletics in the fall? Well, as you've noted, we've had news this morning related to football decisions and other conferences and with another institution. I think um, it's very likely we'll have more news later today and in the coming days. I would sum up where we are now as in a position that is incredibly fluid. There's a lot of movement. There are a lot of well-intentioned good people who are trying to make informed decisions with information that's shifting rapidly. And I think we all are very cognizant of the responsibility we have now to make not only informed decisions, but prioritized decisions related to the health and safety and welfare, not only of our student athletes and coaches, which we've been managing to some degree now for, for a few months, but also to those who would like to join us and be with us during competitions or other events that we typically would have the opportunity to host. So as I know we'll get into, there are a couple of fronts uh, that require a lot of consideration. We've divided in that into an external and an internal view. Uh, so I would describe things now as fluid. And I think you're absolutely right as we sit here on the 5th of August, they are quite likely to change and probably will uh, in some form or fashion between now and whenever we uh, actually end up at our first competition, whenever that may be. And we are to the point here where the can's been kicked down the road for a variety of reasons where there has to be a, all right, are we doing this? How are we doing it? Or are we not doing it? We're to that point now. I, I do think that all of those are contingencies that are still on the table. Yeah. And I think it is um, easy to assume when those headlines are, you know, have not yet been delivered. It's easy to assume that people are, waiting and that people are waiting for you know particular reasons but it's actually quite complex there are a lot of intricacies to it and the medical information we're receiving is is also evolving so um, i've learned a lot this summer i am i am i was not a uh, 
biology or pre-med major. I was not someone who gravitated to the uh, sciences in my educational background, but I have absolutely gone back to school this summer and really starting in the spring and have learned a lot more about infectious diseases and, um, you know, and public health issues that many of us didn't think we would be, um, we would be in. I I'll tell you though, I think that they've been very good discussions. I think they have not only revealed a lot about how to care for our student athletes and for those who are in our system, but also they've revealed a lot about the system itself. Yeah, it's complex, it's elaborate, it's all connected in a lot of ways. And so it is very difficult and challenging to be able to weave through and connect all of the dots that need to be collected, uh, connected. Uh, student athletes back on campus uh, through workouts that have been carefully designed to be able to have social distancing and all of that. What can you update us on as far as the progress to student athletes getting set for a season? Well, we've had uh, three teams on campus through a good portion of the summer for voluntary workouts. We've now just in the in the last week or so started shifting into more organized workouts. And for us, it was really important to uh, examine every aspect of their experience if they were to return to the workouts. And that's everything from what they do at their home before they come to our facilities, where they park, how they enter, all the protocols uh, that they'll have to follow, how they do the workout and how they leave. And since April, we've had an internal GO team led by John Bowman, who um, leads our sports medicine unit here in our department, who's worked with Amy Dean on the administrative side, with um, our executive dean, uh, Ken Johnson, with um, our doctors and representatives from Ohio Health and with the Athens County public health officials to develop a plan that appropriately and safely provides an environment for select numbers of student athletes to come through for workouts. We did um, pre-screening uh, COVID tests back in June as the students were arriving to try to catch any active cases before they came in that allowed us to screen out a handful of students who we asked to wait and recover before they came back. I think that was incredibly effective and well designed by John's team. And so we've continued to manage um, those three teams under those protocols. We now are turning our attention to bringing uh, the rest of the fall sports back to campus and, and how we would manage those numbers as, as uh, campus, as you know, has recently made an announcement that they'll be in a virtual learning environment for the first five weeks. So that gives us a little bit of time with the, the other fall sports to bring them back safely as well. You have to have a plan for when there is a plan to execute all of the plans. We've seen the GO buses around Ohio on the move to be sure. Uh, we got to have a GO team to be able to get things going. See, it all fits again. Does, Go yeah. teams together. Um, how did you come up with those teams and what are the objectives and what are those structures to have a plan for the plan? Well, I mentioned uh, John Bowman a, a moment ago. He leads our internal Go team. That team includes not only John and Amy, um, and with the connection to the medical professionals and public health professionals, but also we included uh, coaches and student athletes, and we have faculty on uh, both our internal and also a second external GO team that's led by Ray Dixon, who manages our ticket office. Michael Stevens has been working with him and his crew. On the external GO team, we have also had coaches and student athletes and, um, and others from campus on that group. And they were all tasked with focusing on either the internal group or the external group on the areas um, that make most sense as you could follow the name. So on the internal side, it was preparing our facilities for workouts, establishing the protocols, getting feedback from our student athletes and coaches as to what they might be comfortable committing to as individuals within that system, and then figuring out how to extend that plan across all of our facilities and all of our sports. On the external side, Ray and his team have done an excellent job reimagining the game day experience in Peden. Um, they also are, have now turned their attention to taking a look at what it might look like in the Convocation Center and in our other facilities. We have 
um, orders from our state out of the governor's office that have continued to evolve throughout the summer. And when we get to the point when we have more definitive outlook for the fall, we will be submitting to the lieutenant governor's office our plans to have spectators uh, back on campus when, when we feel that we'll be ready to do that. So it's an enormous and extraordinary amount of work. They've done a terrific job. I've been really impressed with our coaches and our student athletes who have embraced the opportunity to be part of that planning and have engaged in that as well. And so I think we've done everything we can, as you say, to plan for the plan. Um, and we'll continue to do that through the month of August as well. A lot of things that need to be connected and put together for this to actually move forward. We'll, we'll talk about this in, in a broader scope next month. Um, but during all of this, there has been an awakening uh, about uh, what is right, what is, uh, what is good for, for all human beings. Uh, and that falls into social justice, uh, for the fight against systemic racism, for Black Lives Matter, for all of the, the things that need to be put in place to move forward as a society for all of us to be good people. And, and you have, through largely a student-led group, but with your directive, come up with Bobcat's Lead Change. Um, what uh, do you want your student athletes and the people on that committee to do? What, what are your objectives for that and planning moving forward? Bobcat's Lead Change actually was an idea that was um, a concept over the course of the last year as I arrived last fall and took a look at the department and examined our programming in a number of areas. We identified the opportunity to be a little bit more organized uh, and assertive in developing programming around these issues for our students and for our department. And uh, Tia Jameson, who I know you know is a member of our women's basketball staff, is an individual who also had some really great ideas and a passion for this work. And so she and I first talked about those possibilities back in January, actually. I, I remember January, uh, it, the, the first six months was such a blur, but I know it was January in part because I remember our agreement was let's get through basketball season. And then when she has time, let's sit down and map out a program that we would have launched this fall. Mm -hmm. And then, as you know, um, the pandemic broke at the end of basketball season. We never came back from basketball season. We're still working remotely. And she and I continue to have conversations um, in the wake of some of the events this summer. Then we uh, picked up those conversations. And, and a couple of days later, there was a series of events that happened. She and I spoke. And a couple of days later, we noticed some of our student athletes were speaking up a little bit more on social media. And we're talking to themselves and others and to some of our staff about um, their concern for um, the, the things that they had seen, their concern for uh, the future for all of us, including themselves, and they were looking for a way to be to be involved in 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 shaping that. So really, it was a convergence of timing with some ideas that were already in place. And what I really appreciate from our students this summer is um, something that we thought we might have needed to draw them into is something that they have absolutely run toward, taken over, set the agenda for. They're doing incredible work. Um, as you mentioned, perhaps there'll be a time to talk more about that later, but it really has become a student-led endeavor this summer. And um, they meet weekly. They work, they, they've organized themselves into several different directions. I so much appreciate we have several coaches and staff members and faculty members who have joined with them. And we even have a few of our donors and supporters who have heard about it and have engaged um, in, in some activities with them. So. It, it's um, I'm really excited for them. I'm excited for the lessons they're learning for it, but I'm also excited for what they can bring to our community as a result of that work. No doubt. And, and college athletics and sports in general is for everyone. It should be so diverse and so wonderful to see what can happen when people from all sorts of backgrounds can come together uh, to work together as a team or as fans or, or whatever. Uh, so that is most certainly a positive Bobcats lead change. We'll talk about the, that in the future. Julie, we'll conclude our first interview. And I say good luck to you and everyone involved in trying to put this together and moving forward. It, it's been a pleasure to, uh, to visit with you. I, I've learned a lot. Hopefully our fans did too. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Russ. You know, we appreciate you. Always interesting to visit with a 
high-ranking administrator in college athletics who's been around so many things already in an interesting first year on the job at Ohio, to be sure. To take that a step further, how about an athletic director visiting with a school president during all of this time? Here's an interview with Julie Cromer and Ohio University President Dwayne Nellis. So President Nellis, welcome to First and Finest and welcome to our first on-campus segment. You are our first guest. Well, thank you for the opportunity, Julie. I, I'm honored to be the first guest and to be part of First and Finest. I like that uh, as well. Well, thank you. As you know, there's a little history around that phrase. And so um, several of our staff have launched a series. It's a way for us to be able to stay connected from afar or at uh, appropriate social distancing or virtually, whichever way um, is your fancy. And I think it also gives us an opportunity to reflect on things happening across campus and not just within the athletics department. So thank you for being part of this segment. I think it's always good to lay out a little bit of the landscape and talk about where we as an athletics department fit within the ecosystem of campus. So do you mind just if we have a conversation and start with um, what we can bring to campus and, and why it's important to have sports as part of higher education? Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And uh, of course, it's been a long part of the tradition in the United States and higher education to have uh, athletic programming. And uh, it's an important part of an active student life experience on any university campus, as well as impacting you think of we have 400 approximately 450 student athletes and and they come from all over the world. So they enrich our campus uh, through the the diversity that they bring to our campus uh, and um, it really promotes the university. You think about um, the exposure that the university gains through uh, uh, our athletic programs. Uh, uh, when we're on TV uh, nationally, uh, millions of viewers that have an opportunity to see the Ohio University brand. Uh, but um, but just seeing the growth and the and the development of leadership skills by these uh, these students that are also athletes and seeing that transformation occur during their time at the university is certainly something that is important you also think about the connections that it builds with our alumni base uh, we have around i think over 250 um, alumni uh, living alumni uh, all over the world and uh, for many of them, uh, college athletics is one way through the Bobcats, uh, watching the Bobcats on TV, tracking their success. Uh, it's a way that they stay connected. And uh, many of those conversations I have with uh, alumni, they often reflect on uh, some uh, type of, of athletic um, event that they experienced <laughs> while they were a student at the university. So. Those are all really important uh, connections and uh, something that is exciting uh, about our rich uh, history as an institution. I agree. I think I've shared with you as I've come on board this first year, one of the things I've learned is that while we may have uh, mid-major resources, we are absolutely a university with high major passion. And athletics as a connecting point, I think, is a big part of that. It's not the only part. But it's a big part of that. And I know you and I have been talking a lot this summer about how we will need to reimagine that for the students on campus and for the coming academic year and potentially beyond based on the pandemic. And so um, share with us a little bit of your thoughts about all the things that we are considering as we manage our way through this and thinking about how we create valuable and enriching student experiences um, in these times, in these times of uncertainty and, and the shifting landscape? Well, it really is an unprecedented time uh, for higher education in our university uh, and um, not only Athens, but across our, our uh, umbrella of Ohio University with our regional campuses and extended campuses as well. But certainly uh, for, at the forefront is the, the uh, the safety, the the health, um, the care for our students, as well as our the rest of our university family. So, 
we want to keep that at the forefront and make sure that we whatever we do we we uh, design programs to try to minimize the potential uh, impact of this uh, this terrible virus uh, that is uh, impacting our, our world, and so we're seeking you know guidance at all levels, and um, and uh, that includes at the at the national, state, uh, uh, local level, as well as within our campus uh, community. But but with also keeping in mind that this is an opportunity to. Uh, to to rethink the way in which we interact with our students and uh, to create new learning opportunities for them. Um, they are they are living through something that is again unprecedented in modern history, and so uh, and and we have a lot of very creative faculty who are creating uh, unique types of experiences for our students in the learning environment and. Uh, and also, um, some of those students are going to be on campus this fall and interacting with our faculty on a limited basis and part of our community. And um, and that that community engagement piece and the coordination with the community is an important part of of the environment that we create as well. And um, I'm excited that we've we've created a um, university community compact that's being worked through the details of that that I think will be really helpful in guiding our students as they experience both the university environment as well as what happens within the community. I know that uh, shared governance and broad thinking in decision making are important elements of, of your leadership and so I've seen some of this, but for those who have not, uh, maybe talk a little bit about who are the, where are the offices and who are the individuals you lean on to be able to guide our university through some of these challenges. And I know that you like to surround yourself with a diverse um, group of, of viewpoints, but also it's really important to reach out to the broader campus community and people have been working on that all summer as well. Yeah, it's an excellent example. The way in which uh, we have structured our input for COVID uh, planning um, of shared governance, because we've had uh, over a hundred uh, different leaders from students, uh, staff, faculty, uh, community members engaged in different working groups on various dimensions of uh, planning. Uh, for our university as we move forward and trying to again create a safe environment, but also one that is an engaging environment for our students. Um, and so that's been really important. Um, you know, and that that includes uh, also uh, leaders uh, from faculty senate, uh, from the other senates as well. Our student senate uh, president, uh, Janie Peterson, for example, has been very engaged in this process and some of her colleagues. Um, Robin Muhammad from Faculty Senate, but uh, many others uh, from the other Senates as well. Um, but we also look to people like uh, Ken Johnson, who's our Chief Medical Officer, uh, Gillian Ice, who's leading our public health efforts. Uh, we work very closely with our Athens County um, um, Health Director, uh, Dr. Gaskell. Um, there are state leaders that we consult on a regular basis. We've received guidance from the governor on reopening for higher education. Uh, we've had guidance from the Inter-University Council. Um, and, uh, but we also get input. Uh, I meet weekly with the presidents of the MAC, uh, for example, and get feedback uh, from them. Our president's council group includes the provost, uh, all the other vice presidents, um, you uh, as athletic director, uh, but also uh, our, our general counsel, uh, our government relations people, because as we know, uh, all these different dimensions are very complex and require input from uh, all these different constituencies. So uh, it's an important uh, process to get input as we try to manage and find common ground to, to move forward strategically in the best way that positions our university for again safety but also an engaging learning environment for our students during this unique time. Well as you mentioned I've been involved in some of that. I know it requires a lot of um, zooming and a lot of meeting via Microsoft Teams in these times and it's a little different 
meeting with your colleagues in a tile on a screen when you're used to being face to face. I know that's true. Also, it carries over through a lot of those groups, but particularly um, it, it carries over when we meet with our Mac colleagues. We have been meeting as an AD group two or three times a week for uh, months now, I think since March. I know you've been meeting more frequently with the presidents. Um, what's that like? And uh, what sort of insight are you able to share from those conversations and your work with the other MAC presidents? Yeah, well, it's a great group. Uh, one of the things that um, we we often comment on uh, among the MAC presidents is what a collegial group of, of, of presidents we have leading our institutions that are part of the Mid-America Conference. And, um, and you know, with the keeping at the forefront uh, are the, the safety and welfare of our student athletes and the experiences that they have. And so we want to be very thoughtful about um, creating that environment, uh, having the right protocols in place as we bring student athletes back to campus, um, as we evaluate um, uh, different sports, both um, the uh, uh, major sports like football, but also um, whether it's field hockey or volleyball or um, swimming or whatever, we're, we're thinking of all the different dimensions of these different sports and the, the level of contact that are uh, part of those sports and, and what that means. And I know you as athletic directors are, have uh, some significant input in that. But we're up, but we do have a lot of other dialogue around strategically how we position ourselves at the MAC uh, among the group of five, with the uh, with the uh, Power Five conferences and how we interface with them and how that plays out as we, all of this uh, time of COVID um, um, unfolds uh, before us. So we want to make sure that we position the MAC and our student athletes in, in the best light possible as we work through this. But we haven't stopped too with being creative about new initiatives as well. Uh, things like eSports, for example, the MAC has just started a new eSports conference and there's a tremendous amount of interest uh, at Ohio University in eSports. Uh, we have the largest uh, 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 eSports club, I think, in, 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 uh, in, in, in Ohio and uh, we're anxious to continue to build on that. Um, and we're very proud to the contributions of our our nationally and world ranked sports administration program and how that might complement some of the uh, planning that's going on right now. But but our MAC presidents, they're very uh, again a very thoughtful group, very careful group, and, uh, and but we're walking each day down a, a new path and, and a pathway that's not been uh, walked before. So it's. Uh, it's uh, it's a challenging time, but I, I feel that our our my Mac president colleagues are very thoughtful as they work through these things uh, collectively with us. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I think we've all grown to know one another a little bit more in the AD meetings um, because of the frequency. But also, I think when you're trying to coordinate so many different groups facing a challenge like this pandemic when we have multiple overlapping local requirements that we have to manage across the league, you really have to roll your sleeves up and, and get into it a little bit. What One of the things I've noticed is we have the Ohio schools within the MAC and we are coordinated in a lot of ways beyond athletics through the IUC, as you noted earlier. Right. But as part of an athletic conference, we also have to consider what's going on in the state of New York, in the state of Michigan, in the state of Illinois, in the state of Indiana. That's right. And there are variable circumstances that cover a wide range as we try to ensure that we make the best decisions for this fall. And I imagine that's worked its way into your room as well. Absolutely. And and I might say, too, we're led by... Um, by John Steinbrecher, or the MAC commissioner, who does, a, I believe, an excellent job and not only helping to guide us and provide perspective, but also um, but also networks extremely well and in communicating with other similar types of conferences as we work through this uh, unique time. The debut episode of First and Finest continues with something we're calling 
cover three. There are three guys here who have covered the Cats for a long time now. I'm Russ Eisenstein, the voice of the Bobcats, joined by Rob Cornelius, the best color analyst in the Mid-American Conference and my favorite broadcast partner in my broadcasting career, and Jason Arkley, who is in the fold now with Bobcat Athletics. Um, guys, it's great to see you again. The last time that we saw each other was press row covering a game that didn't happen the night after we had a, a great dinner in Cleveland um, in advance of the whole sports world stop. And you guys hanging in all right? Yep, done well since the intra-squad scrimmage or whatever. We got to broadcast briefly up there and then head home. But you're right, we've been kind of on ice. We're uh, going on four and a half months. Yep, uh, hanging in there. Uh, healthy, sound of sound of mind and body. Uh, doing well. I have, I have no real complaints at this time. So, yeah, it's been a weird few months, though. Yeah, it sure has. And I think we all can't wait to get back to doing what it is that we do. But hopefully everybody is safe and uh, safe and healthy prior to that happening. Um, I, I wanted to set the standard here as we're talking about cover three. That's a football term, obviously. And we're three guys that cover the cats. Um, but wanted to, to let folks know why we do what we do and, and why we do it the way that we do it. Um, when it comes to broadcasting, when it comes to covering this program and, and covering sports in general. So, um, Arkley, let's start with you. When, when you go into covering a team, um, what's your mindset and, and why do you do it the way that you do it? Uh, for me, the driving uh, force has always been to uh, illuminate the public. Those those who are interested in whether it's the Bobcats, uh, a local high school team, somebody else, uh, to let them know the ins and outs, what's going on, who's who's important, what's what's went wrong, what's went well, who's the guy or or girl in, in, on this team that doesn't get the recognition for all the stuff they bring. So I, I'm always trying to to bring more human uh, stories about a program, uh, about a specific team, to the forefront. So. So people have a connection, and that, that connection with Ohio Athletics and, and its longtime fan base has always been really strong, and I feel that I've always felt that was the best way to kind of kind of serve the whoever my consumer is, whoever's reading or, or watching or, or trying to follow the Bobcats, let them know about the people involved in the process, and that's where it all begins with me. Rob, you and I have worked together for 12 years. Hopefully there is a, a year 13, and, and obviously there are some growing pains uh, through style when we first start out trying to feel out each other from a standpoint of strengths and and, and what it is and, and, and how we see a game and how we want to communicate it. The cool thing is you and I, uh, we're, we're sports nerds when it comes to this kind of stuff, and we know each other really well now on how we broadcast. When you go into a game, when you go into a broadcast with me, what is it that you're focusing on, and why do you broadcast the way that you do? Well, Jason makes an important point, and that's to try and make this to personalize it. A lot of these kids that we cover, they may not be local. They're not from Athens County or in case you even Ohio, we were even the country. So how do you take them and introduce them and take the ones that have personality that are interesting, make them part of your stories? And how do you share things that appeal to all levels, all strata of that audience? You know, there's people who are very, very casual fans and there's people that are going to make fun of this show for calling cover three when Ohio runs a lot of quarters a lot of the time. <laughs> it's a different sort of thing. You're dealing with different people. And we always get akin to almost like you and I love to watch The Simpsons have darn near 30 years. It yeah. appeals to people on so many different levels. And you have to serve every audience a little bit. You can't be hyper technical football guy who keeps yelling about you know, three techniques. You've got to appeal to people who don't see the team five practices and one game a week every week for their entire life. How you meet that happy medium and try and appeal to fans without turning them off is, is really, really important. Yeah, I, I think we talk about it often about philosophy and um, trying to stand out and trying to uh, maybe be different uh, than than a lot of others that are out there and, and how we cover a team, how we see a game, how we communicate. I, I've always said that that you don't have to be a player to be able to communicate the game really well. We made up a story once, Rob, that you were a backup punter uh, on what the 97 team was. Yeah, I, I haven't run it by Zastida. Well, that's kind of the gag is that I, I was a backup punter. Then when he got, got to campus in 98, I, I had to go. I had to work on my studies. But the bottom line there is, and Arkley did play, there's no doubt about it, and I'm sure that leads into how he covers uh, a team in a game, um, but you communicate the game so well, and you prove that you don't have to be a football guy player to be able to communicate that game, or in basketball to be able to do it either, and, and infotaining is a word that we talk about, guys. Uh, we've said it on our broadcast, information and entertainment, um, and, and being honest and fair. 
And Arkley, I, I think how we, Rob and I, cover a team is similar to how you cover a team, too. In, in good and bad, being fair to all sides is incredibly important. That's what you That's what you try to do. Is you, It's not about giving people the benefit of the doubt. As it's, You show up each day. You approach the job the same way each day. Uh, and, and basically, if you're just consistent and you're upfront and you're direct and you're honest, then then most people are going to meet you halfway on things. And that's that's kind of what I've tried to structure my 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 beat coverage around. You know, I'm going to be there on Tuesday. I'm going to be there on Wednesday. I'm going to be there the next week. I'm going to be there the month after that. And and with that in mind, I'm not out to get anybody. I'm not out to to break something or bust something wide open. I'm there to give a day to day representation, a day to day accounting of what's going on. And that's that's good stuff. That's bad stuff. That's that's everything in between. And Rob, that's something that we've talked about, too. I think our fans know that you and I really want Ohio to win the game. Uh, but whatever it is that we're seeing, we're going to communicate. We're going to be honest about it. We're going to be fair about it. And the cool thing about it is this this threesome here, we, we've got a lot of years in it. So, so hopefully that equity that we've built up is trust in how we go about the way that we do it, not only for the fans, but for the program, for the players, the coaches that know that we're going to be fair and how we go about things. Yeah, we're, and we want to we want to tell you the truth. Obviously, you're right. Our jobs are easier and at least more pleasant when this team is winning and winning a lot. And there's a bowl or instead of boy tournament. But we want you to trust us. And we're going to tell you the things that are really happening. Remember, these are not grade school kids, but they're not pros either. You're kind of in that happy medium where you do have to leave a little bit of guardrail, a little bit of berm in case people aren't doing the right things. But you figure it out. You get the relationship with the coaches. And they're about long-term relationships. Obviously, we've been with the staff for a very long time. Before that, Brian's staff and the Grobe staff that I, I just love. But between the three of us, alarmingly now, we're getting up there probably about nearly 50 years of MAC coverage oh. or MAC experience. <laughs> yeah. Being yeah. around this program, I mean, you even before you came to Ohio, obviously your northern backgrounds meant a lot of that. But I would say during near 50 years, we put on a little seal, little badge we can all wear together. <laughs> yeah, we joined a club. Depends. Yes, club. Little, little right, club. right, right, right. Add, we, add, we add, add, add a new bobcat every year. Yeah. We turn on our punch card and we get a, a free sub when we're at Kent State or something like that. Yeah, Bottom no, line sure. is the cool thing here um, is this is a department that that I think has embraced what it is that we do. Uh, I, I, I hope the fans have enjoyed what it is that we've done. Uh, and we talk about it often, guys. We want to be the best that we can be in how we cover this team. And, and, and we do it all for uh, fans, but we, we do it for ourselves, too, because we're, we're working in the candy store life and, 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 and talking about and covering sports. Um, and there's the right way to do it. And I, I think that we're trying to, to do that for everybody. Yeah, and we want to get back in here and obviously do this. Give you the audio you want, the video you want, the text that you want, everything that you need to feel close to these guys for however many games we end up playing this fall, hopefully eight, nine, ten, and more. Yeah, Arkley, uh, it's good to have you in the fold, too. Uh, really appreciate you being here. Looking forward to all that you're going to bring to the table. And, Rob C., you're my guy, man. Uh, thanks again for this and look forward to uh, hopefully year 13 with you. Let's go stall back to Athens very soon, brother. All right, that's cover three for this month on First and Finest. During this COVID time, we've had a cat capsule back to some outstanding highlights that were painted green and white. I wish I could take you all back with us to Boise, Idaho, 2011, the first bowl victory ever. There are a whole lot of stories that we could tell on the air, and there are a whole lot of stories that we could tell off the air, too. But the game was the crown jewel. Ohio painted the potatoes green and white then, just like they did this past season. Well, let's go back to 2011, when Ohio beat Utah State for the first bowl victory in school history. The program's sixth bowl appearance came in the famous Idaho Potato Bowl on the blue turf at Boise State. The nine-win Bobcats had to rebound from the heartbreaking 23-20 loss to Northern Illinois in the MAC championship game. They faced the talented seven-win Utah State Aggies then from the Western Athletic Conference. Much like in the next season, the Bobcats traveled further than the team they faced in the bowl. It's 2,066 miles from Athens to Boise and just 296 from Logan, Utah. Early on, Ohio was sluggish. A safety and a short yardage score put the Cats down 9-0 after one. The defense did its job in quarter two and the only points came from Ohio. A 26-yard strike from Tyler Tettleton to Derek Roback with 4.40 left in the half, for a lot of reasons, was a big touchdown, and Ohio was down 9-7 at halftime. 
With 5.51 left in the third, the Aggie advantage turned to 13 on Michael Smith's second score of the quarter. Ohio had to answer, and it did, with another Bobcat big play. On first and 10, ball at the Utah State 44-yard line as Ohio trails by 13. And it's an option right. Tyler pulls it back, has lots of time to throw. Throws it for LeBron Brazil, and he leaps, and he made the catch. Touchdown, Cats! Oh, what a big-time play! 23-16, you give Tyler that much time, and you give LeBron that much room, they're going to hook up every time. The fourth quarter was a punt a Finally at the 2:02 mark, Ohio started at its own 39, and the rest is history. 45 seconds left. Fourth down and six. Ball at the Utah State 14. Big rush on. Tyler has time. Floats it over the middle of the field. It's caught. LeBron Brazil leads for the end zone. Did he get in? No word yet. Touchdown! Touchdown! Oh! LeVon caught the pass, was down at the six-inch line. Raises his leg and takes a snap. Low snap. Pulls it back. Rolls over to the right side. On the run of the end zone. Dies. Touchdown! Counts! Touchdown, Cats! 13 seconds left, tied at 23. What a beautiful play. Now for the most important extra point in Ohio University football history. We're tied at 23. Snap back, placement down, kick through, and it is good. Ohio leads 24 to 23 with 13 seconds left. Now he throws another pass back to the right sideline, and it's intercepted, and Ohio wins. Ohio wins. Ohio wins. For the first time in school history, Ohio University football has won a bowl game. LeVon Brazil was the game's MVP. It was Frank Solich's 50th win at Ohio. It was sheer exhilaration, the program's first bowl of victory. And bang, that's the premier party for first and finest. From Ohio Athletics, we can't thank you enough. We can't do this without you. We're glad that you're able to watch and and enjoy what it is that we do. But we want to thank you for answering our calls, answering our emails as we plan for whatever it is that's going to happen in the future. We can't wait to see you again for all of us to be able to stand up and cheer and to be able to paint it green and white. So if you had any kind of interaction with us over the last couple of months, thank you so much. And we'll be in touch in the future as well. That will do it for our first episode. We'll be back at the same time or thereabouts next month for our second edition of First and Finest. Thanks to everybody in the Sports Information Department at Ohio University, Mike Ashcraft, Mike Schulze, Sarah Ligarski, Bobcat TV, and Zach Roberts, Jason Chapino, and Gracie Huffman. Thanks to everybody that's been a part of this show. I'm Russ Eisenstein. Thank you so much for watching. This has been First and Finest.